Hi, I'm Mike Hutchins, Extension Dairy Specialist at the University of Illinois. This module will discuss protein and its related aspects. Let's quickly review the learning objectives of this module. Certainly, we want to explain the differences between proteins versus fats, carbohydrates, and oils to be sure we know chemically how to define them. Certainly, understand the relationship between amino acids and protein requirements. Also, define what a peptide bond is, how it's formed, and why it's important in animal nutrition. Next, we'll talk a little bit about how you would analyze protein in the lab. Certainly, another aspect is the role of uh, proteins in ruminant animals, and then discuss the importance of essential amino acids. And finally, wrap up with a listing of what are some of the key functions protein handles in livestock nutrition. Let's begin by defining what a protein is as a nutrient. It consists of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen. Now that's key. Notice it's in very bold letters. Nitrogen makes it different. As you recall, when we talked about carbohydrates, fats, and oils, they also contain those same first three elements, but nitrogen makes a difference, and that's what makes it a protein or an amino acid. We have to understand amino acids are the basic building block. We hook amino acids together in polymers, and they therefore form a protein. And that sequencing of amino acids is controlled by DNA transcription and RNA aspects out there in the program. So animals really have an amino acid requirement. That is what is absorbed amino acids. That is what's built together to form such things as milk protein, as casein, or muscle in meat animals. You can see on the amino acids, abbreviated here as AA, and you'll see this from time to time in some of the various teaching materials, the amino acids are built up of two basic structures. They are built up of an amine structure, which is your NH2 amine structure, and it's also made up of a carboxyl, which is actually an acid radical. And therefore, the amino acid name is very logical, amino acid put together. You can see then it can have a number of different compounds in between those two different ends, and that determines which amino acid it is made up of. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, all amino acids contain those four basic nutrients and must contain nitrogen. However, there are a couple amino acids that have a secondary mineral associated with them, and they would be sulfur-containing amino acids. They will also still have the nitrogen, but they will have sulfur. And methionine and cysteine would be sulfur-containing amino acids. Now, when we look at how proteins are formed and actually digested, we looked at peptides. Peptide, or what we call a peptide bond, is where we hook together the amine and the carboxyl N. And this is controlled by basically DNA, and we form something called a peptide bond. And you can see when that is formed, we end up having a water molecule. Remember we talked about metabolic water? Well, there's another one of those metabolic waters being formed. That is your peptide bond. This occurs just backwards when animals digest proteins they break that peptide bond and release it as specific amino acids. And that is how protein is absorbed in the animal. It goes across the intestinal lining as an amino acid, not as an intact protein large molecule. If there are two amino acids hooked together, the term dipeptide will pop up. If we hook three of them together, then obviously the word tripeptide makes sense. And if we run a number of amino acids, and they can be as high as 150 to 200 amino acids together, then we have a complex protein that is utilized in the body for such things as uh, growth, a secretion as milk production and milk protein, or certain other important compounds in the animal itself. A few other protein facts and figures may be useful to know as we discuss proteins. We already mentioned that the peptide bond links two amino acids together. That results in a protein if it's made up of a string of these amino acids, and just the reverse occurs in the small intestine when we digest it. Protein requirements are quite varied. Depends a great deal on the species. For example, is it a chicken or a dog? Depends on the age. Obviously, if a young animal is growing, they have a different protein requirement as they lay down tissue. And obviously, if you have a lactating cow or sow producing quantities of milk, that also affects it. The amount of protein, or in this case, amino acids, required for that animal to perform those very important functions. Now, the next step is, well, how do I measure it in a lab? How do I measure protein? And the basic procedure, which you will have to remember and know, is called the Keldahl. Kind of unusual spelling. You will not have to spell it, but you'll have to recognize the Keldahl procedure. And simply what that is, we take a certain amount of feed. Let's say we take 100 grams of a feed, and we then mix it with sulfuric acid, and we reflux it. it means we heat it up, and we cook it, and there may be some other additives added to it, and it forms ammonia, ammonia gas. 
Then in the apparatus, we collect that ammonia gas that is captured and then measured by using other titratable uh, chemicals and actually measure the amount of ammonia in there. We then know, based on nitrogen itself and protein, that it contains the equivalent of 6.25. Let's explain that a little differently. If I had 100 grams of protein, of that 100 grams of protein, it would be 16 grams of nitrogen. And that would be 16% or the constant 6.25. Now, you must also know that because that's how we make the conversion. So if you go into the lab and you analyze a sample of feed, and based on the Keldahl procedure, it has 3% nitrogen, you would multiply 3% nitrogen by 6.25. And that means that feed contains roughly about 18.75 or 19% crude protein. And that's how we would actually measure protein in the lab using the Keldahl procedure. Let's then move to another important concept on protein amino acids, and that is called essential amino acids. These amino acids must be partially supplied by the diet. In other words, the animals cannot synthesize it in adequate amounts to maintain whatever productive function they have. Another term referred to as indispensable amino acids. You'll see them referred both ways in textbooks and various literature. There are 10 essential amino acids, and they are listed below for you. Phenylalanine, valine, tryptophan, threonine, isoleucine, methionine, histidine, arginine, lysine, and leucine. The good news is you will not have to regurgitate this on a test, but these are the 10 essential amino acids that many software programs will balance on. One way to remember these, if you need this little trick in the future, is remember Private Tim Hall. Each letter stands for a different amino acid. But as I pointed out, you do not need to know these amino acids in this class, but you must understand why they are called essential or indispensable. Now let's take a quick look at the ruminant animal. The ruminant animal is a bit unusual because it has a very large fermentation vat in front of the digestive tract or the beginning of the digestive tract. And what happens is nitrogen-containing compounds. This could be amino acids, this could be urea, this could be protein, this could be green grass, this could be corn. The nitrogen compounds are degraded to ammonia. In most cases, about two-thirds to three-quarters of them broken down to ammonia. This ammonia is that same ammonia you have when you have a cleaning agent, for example, very strong odor. The bacteria then will convert the ammonia over to microbial protein. And this is a very high-quality protein, meaning it has a beautiful balance of essential amino acids for the dairy animal, and it has a very good complementation. In fact, you and I could eat bacteria protein. I'm not sure we want to do that every day, but certainly that would be extremely high-quality protein in our diets as well. So that's what happens to nitrogen in the rumen of the animal. The neat trick, of course, is that it can take some low-quality proteins, for example, grass, corn silage, corn stalks, and they can convert that low-quality protein into something that is very high-quality, such as meat or milk or wool. So the ruminant has ability to take in feedstuffs that you and I cannot handle. There are two sources of amino acids for ruminant animals. The first one, of course, is the microbial amino acid, which can represent 60 to 70 percent, in some cases even higher amounts, of the amino acids needed by a given animal. And the other source would be the undegraded protein in feedstuffs or amino acids called undegraded protein and have different requirements and levels depending on the type of animal and diet being fed. Now, this is a very complex slide, and it kind of shows what we talked about a bit earlier. Let's walk through this and show you the different things. You can see on the left side is the feed is coming into the rumen of the animal. A ruminant has four complex stomachs. This is the first part of that complex stomach. The dietary or feed nutrients come into the rumen, and it breaks down to peptides. Remember, we break down those peptides, and it breaks down to amino acids. And, of course, those can be broken down then into ammonia. And we have what we call the ammonia pool located right in the middle of the rumen. Now, the neat thing is the bacteria use this as a source of nutrients. And they combine that with carbohydrates and they make that into microbial protein. And, of course, then the animal eats the microbes. Doesn't sound very appealing to me, but it does a very good job for ruminant animals. And, of course, this becomes a source of amino acids for the animal. So, as you can see, as we go to the right, this goes out of the animal as protein. In this case, microbial protein goes to the small intestine, is broken down to amino acids and absorbed into the bloodstream. You can see that is where about 55 to 65% of the feed goes that direction. See that bottom arrow? That's the 45% of the protein that does not break down. 
And that depends on such things as the type of feed, the heating processes, or other chemical reactions we can do with the feedstuff to make it less degraded in the rumen. And of course, that's the other source of the protein going for ruminant animals. Now, the trick is you'll see that ammonia pool in the middle. If that gets too large, then the rumen actually uh, absorbs that and kicks it out into the bloodstream. And then the animal has to deal with this as a toxic product, converting it over to urea in the liver. And then the liver kicks that on out and it can get recycled potentially. As you see, urea coming in there at the 11 o'clock position on this slide, or it goes to the kidney and it's excreted in the urine as a waste product. And of course, that affects the environment. And obviously the cow or the sheep or the beef animal gets no use out of it. So this is a very complex reaction. And then you'll take a whole class on this later here and various studies on the ruminant itself. Then we can look at proteins in terms of their functions in the animal's body. There are two major functions. The first one is to build and form proteins. Muscle, meat, eggs, wool, and milk would be an example. Another function would be the formation of bone matrix and cartilage. Enzymes are another important function to digest food. And of course, hormones such as insulin and growth hormone are essential for the animal. And finally, antibodies, which are part of the immune system. And this is the major function. A second use of proteins or amino acids are for energy. And this will occur during starvation or high energy demands, such as during milk production. So let's summarize this module. You and I must understand the differences between protein and other sources of energy, such as fats, oils, and carbohydrate. And the magic element? Nitrogen. Remember, sulfur can also pop up in a few of the amino acids. We must also understand that animals really have an amino acid requirement, not a protein requirement. You and I must understand what peptide bonds are and why they are important in forming a protein and digesting a protein to be absorbed as amino acids. Next, we must understand how to measure protein in the lab, and that would be the Keldahl process. And finally, again, a step on ruminant animals. We must understand what is unique about ruminants. Remember, it breaks down about two-thirds of the nitrogen to ammonia and reforms it into a beautiful, high-quality protein called microbial protein. Next, we must understand what is the importance of an essential amino acids, meaning it must be provided in the diet, also known as indispensable amino acids. And then, of course, the two major functions of protein would include as a source of making protein structure in the animal and a source of very expensive energy. Well, that completes this module. Thanks. Have a good day.